Welcome back. We're here for another session with Walter and Sonika's life story. And we are talking about his evangelism overseas. Now, Walter, when you came to Canada, you did that series in Massey. And that, like, that series was actually called Truth Matters back then. And only two or three little small lectures were about the Masonic and occult orders. And, and uh, you received a lot of opposition about those. And now, shortly thereafter, a few years later, you, you expanded them and decided that there was more evidence that was needed to silence the critics. So we now have to a onslaught. How did you get that additional information? Well, you see, the problem is with people that grow up in the truth, they are so protected from the world, they think that these things are unnecessary. Why don't we, why don't we just preach Jesus? Why do we have to preach about things like this? They don't understand. They're sitting beautifully, comfortably in the church, enjoying all the privileges, while people like I was out there in the world, destitute, robbed of truth. I mean, one of my colleagues was a Seventh-day Adventist. He sat next to me in an office, not far from me, 19 years and never opened his mouth. When I became an Adventist, I thought I was going to clobber him. 19 years and he doesn't tell me. And this is how I felt. So this was not information for them. They were already comfortably sitting there. This was for the outside world. There may be other people who feel like you did. Exactly. And someday. this is where I came from. And people say, how can you speak against Catholicism in this way? If John Knox hadn't gotten up and preached Daniel chapter 7 to the Scots, they would all be Catholic today. But the whole nation became Protestant on the strength of one sermon. But I think that's a very important point. You know, after hearing your whole life story, I think many people are wondering, how could so many things happen within one lifetime to one person? And all of them fascinating and interesting. And, you know, it feels like you'd have to live a thousand years to experience all those things that you have experienced. But I think that it's because you did, you do something for God. You, you, you didn't be, you weren't like that man who just did your job and sat in an office and not say anything and pay off your debt and be very quiet. But despite your debt, despite all the hindrances, you wanted to work for God. And people who are going to work for God are going to experience something exciting in their life. There's going to be opposition and, and then they're going to be tested. What do you always say about boring? <laughs> well, sometimes I think it would be nice to have some, some peace and quiet for a change. But I realize the time is short and if we don't do it, who's going to do this work? And there are very few evangelists in the world, if you think of it. There are just a handful of people that are still preaching this message. And um, we f in the beginning it was tough, it was hard for us because our children were small and he had to go alone and I had to stay home and, well, you know, many things happened to you when, when, when he started giving these lectures um, it was like Satan was trying to attack the family he was, he was um, going full out to either destroy me or the children or him for that matter yes I know I remember how many times he would be gone and Satan yes. would be attacking you yes many times yeah. but we kept on going and the Lord helped us through all those things. Some of, some of these things are pretty traumatic, some of the things that, are hap that happen, and particularly the opposition. Now, the opposition from without, that's there and it's gone. Mm -hmm. But the opposition from within is always with you. It's much worse than the opposition yeah. from without. You know, when we were in um, Oklahoma, we did a series in Baton, was it in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? And 
if you remember when we were there, we met so many people who were in the church who were also members of Freemason lodges. And we had some horrendous stories told to us of people who had first-hand experience with these things that you were talking about, even sacrifice and 33-degree Mason things. And that's where we really realized that this is an untapped or unreached group of people who is really not aware of what is going on in the secret societies and, and they're just blissfully joining them and thinking everything is fine, that they can actually be church members and also members of Masonic That's right, and, and our members don't understand that these things are real. Yes. They don't understand the force that is controlling everything from behind the scenes. Because a human mind cannot by itself pull all these strings together and make all the puppets dance. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. So behind the scenes, there are demonic forces. The dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority. I had to deal with the dragon power. It was in my life. I had to f have physical confrontation with him, spiritual confrontation. There were some issues which became non-negotiable. The issue of creation and evolution. That's non-negotiable. I'd come out of evolution. I was an evolutionist, a convinced evolutionist. I wrestled it with it with, with every fiber of my being. I had to know every answer. I wanted to know why. I wanted to be convinced. And having gone through that entire process with all the miracles that we've already told, associated with it, finally come to the conclusion God's word is trustworthy. And then come into your church and find people who walk out of your audience because they're evolutionists. Yeah. I taught for a number of years at a college in South Africa, our colleges. I taught the faith and science and I taught the creation model. And then one year my workload got too big and I couldn't do it. The next year they're preaching evolution. You feel like you want to go and modify the place. You come to our colleges and you go to a great university in California and what are they doing? Propagating evolution. Mm -hmm. And they're telling, telling you to wise up and come up to the times. Good grief. Have they been where we were? No, we wrestled our way out of it, not to get back into it. Exactly. We come out of the occult world. We've dealt with demons. We've dealt with all of these issues yeah. and then we're not going to expect and accept spiritual formation and sit there and have repetitive blabbering in order to get a state of consciousness so that some demon can control my mind. Good grief. It's non-negotiable. Resist it with every fiber of your being. Of course, the devil will have to try and bring these things into the church. One of the biggest issues that caused a major furor was the issue of Bible translations. Mm -hmm. Now, having dealt with the occult world, this was a phenomenal thing. Knowing that a word here and a word there and reading the writings of Westcott and Hort, where these people themselves say that they changed the word here and they changed the yeah. word there to give it an entirely different meaning and that they belonged to ghostly guild societies and that they dabbled in the occult and that they were members of secret societies and wrote uh, the oaths of, of allegiance for these societies. And then people are so, how shall I say this, blissfully asleep that they do not see that there is a major issue here. Now, I don't know whether I should say this, but maybe I should. I was in Europe and I was going to preach in the East Block and I landed in the heart of Europe, in a capital city. <laughs> and a man came to pick me up, a Seventh-day Adventist, who had been on the Eastern side and he had been in the military and he was responsible 
to for people to make sure that they didn't cross the wall. So he would, you know, shoot people if they crossed the wall. He was that was his job. He was a communist through and through. And when he picked me up, I had three hours in 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 the car with him, and we traveled to a little town. And he was telling me a story, amazing story, about how he came out of this communism with this hatred for, for the West. And anybody who wanted to go to the West was something that had to be annihilated. And then, of course, the wall fell. And their world crumbled. And those that were in the military became part of the Western military. And so now he was still in employ, but he received his money from another source. And when he got his first paycheck, there was a deduction for church tax. And this freaked him out. So he went to the officers and said, excuse me, what's that? What's this deduction? They said, well, that's what we do. We deduct church tax. He says, I don't belong to any church. Take that away immediately. I'm not paying any church tax. They said, it's not so easy. You must first resign from your church. He says, I resign from the church. So they said, you can't do that. You have to say, from which church do you resign? He says, I don't know. <laughs> what church? What's the biggest church here? So they say, a Protestant church. <laughs> so he says, good. I resign from, let's, let's say, the Lutheran church. I resign. So he resigned. That weekend he spoke to his family and said, how, how silly these people were to deduct this and it. They said to him, but you're not a Lutheran. So he went back to his military officers and says, excuse me, I resigned from the wrong church. Just correct that. I resigned from the Catholic Church. So he resigned from the Catholic Church. And this is what he was all about. And then at some stage in his life, he'd come into contact with Adventists. And after the war fell, his life fell apart. He wasn't, you know, his ideology went was gone, he was, he was destitute, so he decided he was going to look for an Adventist church. But he didn't know what church was, he thought it was some club. So he went to a church, found a minister, and the minister talked to him and he said, I want to join your club. He said, no you can't, you must first have Bible studies. Okay, initiation process, let's get this over with. Went to a few Say, what's next? You must be baptized. What's that? You go under the water, you come up. Great. So he went down the water and came up. Now he's been initiated. <laughs> now what happens? Now you come to church every, every Sabbath. So he went to church every Sabbath and after a while he said, and now what? This is, this is boring. Don't you do anything? You just sit here and sing. Is that it? <laughs> this is what his mindset was like. It's so funny. And then uh, they said to him, no, well, we've just gotten back all the things that the communist government had confiscated. They'd kept that all neatly stacked away somewhere, but it was now, you know, two generations old. So you can help us sort it out and incinerate what we don't need. And so they finally found a lot of books and stuff. And there he had the books. And he said, what do I do with these books? And they told him, no, the books aren't necessary, they're outdated. So he said, are they Adventist books? And the person said, yes. And they turned out to be Spirit of Prophecy books. So he thought, well, if they're Adventist, I'm not going to incinerate them. He took them home. And he started reading them. And then suddenly he discovered what it was all about. And he thought to himself, oops, I'm the only one left. Nobody else believes this anymore. I've just discovered something. And so he went across many churches and eventually he found a number of people that believed the same. And then in this liberal milieu, they start a little church with just a handful of people who still believe those truths. And this little church was the one that invited me. Amidst all of this, so they'd organized a public campaign, but one of our colleges, one of our big colleges, 
knowing what I preach about secret societies and all of these things, had forbidden their students to come to the lectures and sent out an official letter that the students were forbidden to attend, mm -hmm. which was a perfect invitation. You can't give a student a better invitation. Of course, they all attended. And the leadership or the rectorship of that institute, uh, well, how shall I say it? They, they would minimalize the spirit of prophecy. And the leading figures there, one of them said that you cannot be dictated to by a woman with just three years of education. So you can understand the mindset there. So I get to this hall the first night. The students are all there. It's quite packed. They'd arranged everything. There was a umpa band there. And this was doing its thing. And the, the, mayor. the mayor. The mayor was there. And it was quite a performance. So uh, I'm getting there. And the pastor had come to me and begged me not to say anything contentious. Please don't speak about this. Please don't speak about the papacy. Please don't do that. But the Bible says, and the spirit of prophecy says, that we must preach about these things. Because there's this three angels message, and you warn against the beast, and you warn against the false prophet, and we're supposed to do those things. And the spirit of prophecy says, expose the wickedness of the man of sin, and that he has not changed, and that if you have a tendency to move towards him, it means that you're backslidden. So there's this conflict, this constant conflict. So how do you deal with this? And as I get into this place, a man comes up to me and he says to me, are you going to preach the three angels' messages? And I thought, well, it must be an Adventist, because how would you know, right, what three angels' messages are? I said, yes. He runs onto the stage, he screams at the people and says, get out, get out, this is an evil man, he's going to preach the three angels' messages, get out. Uh, and I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, get rid of this man. I don't know what to do now. And he just keeps on screaming and screaming. And as he screams, he walks out and carried on screaming in the street. <laughs> right. Recovery. Oompa band settles things down. <laughs> get onto the stage. Say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, in my pathetic German. Next minute. A lady falls off her chair. Ah, there she lies. Medics come. Everybody's in turmoil. Takes a whole while to take her away out the side and take care of her. She fainted for whatever reason. This is the type of thing you're dealing with all of the time. Now, I'm not new at this. I know what's happening. So I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, help me. So obviously, this must be important. Yeah. So, Walter, you've had a lot of opposition in Germany, not just with the little church situation, but every time you go there, you seem to get into another trouble. And in the last one you went, there was a lot of trouble. Tell us about that. Well, let me first say something about Germany. I have German roots, right? And it's almost like I'm a sucker for punishment. I always go back and I always get beaten when I go there, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. But you know what? It's a, it's a sign of the war. It's a symptom. I've met such wonderful people in Germany, such kind and sweet and gentle people. And I've met such hard-headed people, like I was. So we butted heads on many, many occasions. And I think God has used my life to prepare me for some of these confrontations that would come. And uh, almost like telling the headmaster of the school, do you want to give me another blow? Mm -hmm. Not that I like blows, and not that I do this because I'm a masochist, but these people were the children of the Reformation. And I think that they are under special attack, and Satan hates them. Martin Luther gave something to the world, 
that he's going to make that nation pay for and he's made them pay ever since that day. Mm -hmm. They have been degraded, they have been uplifted, they have been destroyed, they have been rebuilt and re destroyed again. That nation has had a very, very hard time and some of them have become so hardened that they find no place for God. And some of them are so battered that they long for God. And I think God is looking upon that nation with tears in his eyes. And so why do I go back? I go back and I go back because I believe there are still some there who God is, whom God is calling. So with that as a background. Now when last I was there, I was accused of anti-Semitism. And uh, it's pretty clear that those who did the accusation came from within and not from without. And, well, that is a rather sad situation. Now, am I an anti-Semitic? The answer is no. I'm anything but an anti-Semitic. I'm not an anti-Semitic, I'm not an anti-Muslim, I'm not an anti-Hindu, I'm not an anti-white, an anti-black, anti-Hispanic or anti-anything. I'm a pro-God. And I want every tribe and nation and people to accept salvation in Jesus Christ. But I did say that the current theology of events in a literal Israel being the culmination of prophecy was wishful thinking. Mm. And that the literalism that we have in the dispensationalist theology of the day, that that literalism is not biblical. Now, dispensationalism teaches a literal fulfillment of the literal promises to a literal Israel. And I said, firstly, there's a spiritual Israel because the promises are transferred from the literal to those who are in Christ. That's the first thing. That's biblical. Paul said so. If you are in Christ, you'll be Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise. So that's the theological side. But even physically, they cannot be the heirs because the European ones largely come from the Khazars and this caused major problems because the Khazarian theory was one that was disputed hotly because this would mean that they're, they're not even Semites, that they come from Yafid, so they cannot be the literal heirs. And so all of this was used against me and I'd said that the nation had been herded mm -hmm. uh, like cattle in the Nazi regime and this was considered anti-Semitic. In actual fact, I considered this the exact opposite. Yes. Because that's what they had done to them. Mm -hmm. They had humiliated them. They had treated them evilly, badly. And uh, so I, I thought as a, as a positive, but they interpreted as a negative. Yeah. They thought that the Khazarian theory that I was presenting was ludicrous. And the accusation was then handed over to the authorities and they had to investigate it, which they did over a six-month period. But the interesting thing is, just a few weeks after I presented those lectures, their magazine, Der Spiegel, which is like Time magazine, came up with a big article defending the Khazarian theory or reporting on the Khazarian theory. And so here was, was a secular source saying exactly the same thing mm -hmm. that I had said. That's the first thing. And uh, that must have put the cat amongst the pigeons. And then uh, the Jewish guild themselves said that there was no anti-Semitism. And finally, the courts also threw out the accusation. But why did God permit this? Because this is quite quite a serious issue. I believe that we are very close to the time of the shaking. And I believe God wants to make prominent the difference 
between those who want to stand by the theology of the, of the Bible and those who want to follow an ecumenical line of thinking. And if you want to accommodate everything that the Bible calls Babylon and, and make that your theology, then you are in serious trouble. Is it even bad to call religious systems that no longer follow the precepts of the Bible Babylon? Is it bad? Because God says, come out of her, my people. So God's people are in those systems. Mm -hmm. This is not an attack against people. This no. is an attack against systems. And if we don't give the prophetic trumpet a certain sound, how will we know where to rally? Mm. And how will people know what to come out of if they're not exactly. given the definition? So when we have these campaigns where we say, oh, we have to watch out for the mark of the beast, or beware of the false prophet, but we don't say who the beast is, and we don't say who the false prophet is, let alone what his mark is, then what's the point? Yeah. You might as well leave it. So I believe it is to make issues prominent. And if he counts us faithful and worthy to suffer as a consequence, then so be it. You see, when everything goes wrong, then I know God wants this thing done. Exactly. And I've said this to you many times, right? The more the opposition, the more important it is that mm -hmm. this thing gets done. And I gave my lectures, and that's where the furor started, with the Bible and this occultism, you know, this is not necessary, and uh, they were preaching that the modern translations are so much better than the old translations, and they tried to label me with a King James only man, or this or that. How could they do that? I was quoting Luther. He didn't write the King James, did he? Mm -mm. And uh, it was a received text versus the Alexandrian text's issue. And of course they all cited for the new one and I was to be banned and all of these issues. And then I was told that I didn't have the right information, I'm not a theologian, I'm getting on to holy ground, I have no right to speak about these issues. And, you know, this, this issue of holy arrogance <laughs> comes up and I say to myself, do you have to be a theologian in order to preach the Word of God? Mm, that's definitely what people are saying now. Isn't that what they're saying? That's definitely the new trend. Well, that disqualifies the apostles. Absolutely. It disqualifies John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And all our pioneers. Yes, oh, all they the were children. They were children. Yes. yes, they were 17 years old, 16 years old, 12 years old. I mean, ludicrous, ludicrous. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, it's useful if someone is a theologian with his head screwed on right. That could be very useful, as we've already discussed. discussed. Paul mm -hmm. was one. And uh, we also did say he had to be struck blind in order to see. But now, I have to have information. Now these people, they are in academia. They're thinking academically. They're like evolutionists. In academia, thinking academically. And all the, all the scientists in the world can't be wrong, can they? Hmm. Or can they be wrong? Hmm. It's a paradigm shift, isn't it? Are you in this paradigm or are you in that paradigm? These people don't understand the war behind the scenes. No. And I don't think they really think about what does a word do and what is a word there. But I'd read the occult writings. And I knew what the occult world was saying. And I knew that Westcott and Hort were saying the same things as the occult world. And now it was an issue. I needed evidence. I needed evidence. Now, you can get the writings of Blavatsky. I have them on a disc. But the people will say, who's Blavatsky? They don't understand that Blavatsky is to the occult world 
what Ellen G. White is to Seventh-day Adventists, except they have more respect for her than we have for the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Some of our people are saying that, yes, she has the same inspiration, but she doesn't have the same authority. And you cannot use her for exegesis. You can only use her for homiletics. Well, if she doesn't have the authority, then how can she have the same inspiration? They're mutually exclusive. Yeah. It's either one or the other. And if you cannot use her for exegesis, then you might as well trash her. So that's not getting rid of her, but that is making her of non-effect. Mm -hmm. And so I said to my wife, I need absolute proof. I have it. But I don't know whether they will trust something that comes off a web page, something, because that's another accusation. Oh, he gets it from the web page. Oh, he gets it from an obscure source. Morals and dogma is an obscure source. That shows such blatant ignorance it boggles the mind. But leave that as it were. Then I said to her, we need the original writings of Blavatsky. I don't want them on a desk. I know what it says, but things are cut out. I need it from the best source. Now, remember I told you that my father-in-law had made me take back books? Yes. And I'd met the channel, and this is now, what, 20 years later? And I say to my wife, we need to go to them, because I tried to get the original sources. Impossible. We went to every esoteric bookstore that there was, couldn't get them. And so we decided we would go. But we were on our way to Australia, and we didn't have much time. And so I said to her, we'll go, just before we fly, we'll go there and we'll see if we can get those books. But how are we going to get in there? We're now going on to whose ground? Satan's ground. Yes, we're going on to Satan's ground. So I said to myself, well, I'm not going on to Satan's ground without serious prayer. And I'm not going there because I want to prove a point necessarily or to prove myself right. But if this is important, then God will help us so that we can show that the occult world says that the new translation based on the new manuscripts are in line with Kabbalism and only a Kabbalist would be able to translate them so that the esoteric meaning of the texts can come out. And Westcott and Hort had said those very things, that they would change a word here and they would change a word there so that to the surprise of everyone, even the most informed, all these changes would be there and they wouldn't even know it. And so I said to her, she must come with me because I'll never get in there by myself. And I'll use her maiden name because that was the name of my father-in-law. So you tell the story. I'm talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we rang the bell at the door. There was a high security gate. Was this the same place that you did the same place? To? But it had changed a bit. There was now security around the, the house and we rang the bell but there was no one there so we went away and we came back again and this time we rang again and somebody answered and he said who are you mm. and and he immediately used my father's name and he said I've, I'm the husband of the daughter of so-and-so and, -so, and um, we would like to come and speak to you and the man immediately when he heard my father's name immediately said, you can come in. Mm -hmm. And so we went in. And on our way up to the front door, there was a building next to the, the house, uh, quite a tall building, and the top story window opened. And this woman leaned out and she looked at us and her eyes were wild and weird. And she shouted at us, and, but we couldn't hear she wasn't saying any words, she was just making noises and screaming at us. And he quickly ran up and he, you know, quieted her down and closed the window. And, and so we went into the 
house. Things have changed. I think previously where there was the temple with the, the triangle and the purple, it was all gone. Mm. It was now just a normal house. But there was almost like a, um, a reception area with a bookcases and, and many chairs. So it seems like it was a meeting room. Um, yes, and you can explain further about the books and what happened there. So I said to him, I'm looking for the man who used to live here. And I mentioned the channel's name. So he said to me, he's dead. This was 20 years later and he was a, not a young man at that stage anymore. So I said, well, is is there anything left of what there was? They said, yes, I'm his replacement. I'm the man now. I said, ah, thank you. So why are you here? He said, I said, well, I'm actually on a quest. I'm looking for the original writings of Blavatsky. But I didn't want to tell him why. So he says, oh, you want the original writings of Blavatsky? He says, well, unfortunately, they're not available. You can't have the original volumes of those works. But I have many books for you. Come, I'll show you. So he took me to a table and there were lots of books lying there. And I remember one of them was Bridges and I said, I've read that. And then there was Alice A. Bailey stuff. I said, I've read that. And he said, so do you want none of these? I said, no, I don't want them. I've read them all. And he took his hand like this and he, he wiped them to one side. So he said, so you're done with these? And I said, yes, I want Blavatsky. And he looked at me and he said, Blavatsky. Well, if you want Blavatsky, that means you have arrived. <laughs> and I said, oh, thank you. He says, but I can't just give you Blavatsky. What esoteric school do you belong to? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. So I had to do some quick thinking and I said, I don't belong to an esoteric school. I only know what my father-in-law taught me. And so he talked some about that. And he kept on saying, oh, Blavatsky. And then he kept on showing me other things. And then he said, let me show you this. And this was fascinating. He took me to a bookshelf. And there was a Bible commentary. As we would have a Bible commentary, there was a Bible commentary. And I took a book down and I started reading. It's the esoteric interpretation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So everything that's good becomes evil. Yahweh becomes Satan and Satan becomes Yahweh. Everything is gospel reversal right the way through. And I picked this up. So I said to him, this is interesting. What do you do with these? He says, well, we give Bible studies. So I said, okay, so you give esoteric Bible studies. He says, yes, we have a class here and we meet. But I also lecture elsewhere. I don't know how to say this carefully. Let us put it this way. He trained high-ranking theologians in the esoteric schools. And he also told me that I couldn't have these books because even if he died, the books would have to go to high-ranking theologians. Now that's fascinating to me because that meant that some of the high-ranking theologians that are preaching or teaching students are actually trained in occultism and esoteric knowledge. Now, this is not some conjecture of mine. I'm here in this terrain. I'm getting it out of the horse's mouth. And he's almost making it his boast. But I didn't have too much time and so I said to him, we have to go because I have to go to the airport and I'm sorry that you didn't have it. But he wasn't through yet so he said, wait a minute and he went downstairs somewhere and he returned and he packed out Blavatsky's writings mm. in front of me. Uh, he was whetting my appetite of course. Now 
Let me make this quite clear. I don't want to read Blavatsky's writings. They're nauseating to me. I've struggled through them. I've read what she has to say. And uh, Isis Unveiled, all of these books, I've read them. When I was still in the occult world, but I never had the original writings, so that I can verify absolutely page so-and-so, this is real. So then he said, but you can't have them, of course. So I said, but can't you get another copy? Mm -hmm. He said, no, I can't. And we were just about to leave. He says, I do have one more copy, but unfortunately you can't use it. I said, why not? He said, it's in a foreign language. And then he disappeared downstairs and he came back with it and he put it down there and it was in German. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to seem excited. So I said, that's a pity, it's in German. He said, yes. I said, well, you know what? Some of the words I probably won't understand and I can use a dictionary. Maybe it could help me after all. Would you, would you give them to me or sell them to me or whatever? I didn't bring much money or anything like that. He says, oh no, you can't buy them. They're priceless. So I said, but I don't want them for nothing. He says, no, no, no. And then he said, you know what? How much money have you got on you? <laughs> so I opened my wallet and I had, what is it, 300? I had 300 rand, that's 30 dollars. So he said, make that a token donation. And he took it and I got the writings. Now, why did I want them? The reason why I wanted them is because they state categorically Historically, that the old Bibles that the Protestants used, the Protestant version, that poisonous asp, same wording basically as the Jesuits used for, that, for those writings, that they had been changed esoterically, and then she proceeds to show how they were changed esoterically, and gives the esoteric meaning. And then she says that the only ones who would resist this esoteric interpretation would be the Adventists. Mm. Now, why would she say that? And so this is information that is important and it is verified to me that it's not some airy-fairy source, but by the highest occultist in the country when you have those writings you have arrived. Mm -hmm. I don't want to read those writings. I've been there. I don't need esotericism in my life. But I do need to know that when I state something of this nature, it's verifiable. Is that the quote you gave, you put into the Bible versions document? That's correct. Now, you can say what happened when we left. Well, when we left, again, this window opened and this lady mm. just poured out and she looked down on us and she was going absolutely crazy. It's almost like she was trying to tell him not to let us go. And she kept on screaming and he apologized that she, you know... There were no normal words. She said she was in the state or something. Yeah, he obviously, you know, she had mm. um, some problem, but... But it was almost like she was trying to stop us from, from going. And we left very quickly and we were out, out, out the gate. And we thank God that we had come out of there in one piece. Yes. And that perhaps it was more important for me being under attack from everyone on the outside to have it absolutely verified and established that this was solid ground mm -hmm. so that I couldn't be moved and I believe that is what happened. Now many of the occult writings that I, that I had, I, I had them in, in boxes and they broke into our house and what they did was amazing. They, they took some of my son's clothing they, they took all my slides, my lectures, and they were all neatly packed into lectures, and there were many of them, 
thousands of slides. They took them all and emptied them on the carpet. They didn't take them away and they mixed them all up. It took me weeks to resort my lectures into a series. It was, it was horrendous. And they stole the occult books. They took them out of my house. So God protected your slides, but he let them mix them up. <laughs> he let them make them up, yeah. <laughs> now, I want to talk a little bit more about your, some, of the, some of the trials you experienced during your evangelism. I remember one time when Sonica was very ill, and you were doing an evangelistic series. Tell us about that. At one stage, I was doing evangelism, and Sonica became very ill and had to have an operation. And we told the surgeon that she leads and that they, she wanted to donate blood, right? Yeah, she wanted to donate her own blood before the operation so that if she should bleed, then, and the surgeon said, Ugh, nonsense, he'll sort that out, that's no problem. And then they did the operation and she was in terrible pain. And it didn't improve and it didn't improve and she got very weak. So I, I had the surgeon called and I said, you know, there's something wrong here. And uh, he hadn't put a drain in. And I said, there's, you know, what's happening here? And he said, no, it's normal. And he, and he read the the hemoglobin level of the blood, then he said, the instrument is not in order, there's something wrong with it, she'll be fine. And he sent her home. And at home she was getting worse and worse and worse. And, in fi and finally she could only whisper. So I was rather desperate, so I called our house doctor. And the house doctor came, and she took one look and she said, She's hemorrhaged inside. Her whole abdomen is full of blood. And we have to rush her to the hospital. She was going into a coma. So she said, she came out to me and she said, I don't want to, to upset you, but I don't think she's going to make it. And in the meantime, I've got my two children in the house. And I'm dealing with this crisis and I'm trying to get an ambulance or something, she says, there's no time for an ambulance. No time to wait for an ambulance. You have to put her in the car. So she was wrapping up and my daughter goes hysterical because my cat, uh, we had a Siamese cat, had run into the road and a car had knocked her over. Mm -hmm. But she was still alive and so she ran and she jumped through the window and she jumped onto my daughter's lap and died on my daughter's lap. Oh, no. So here this cat dies on my daughter's lap. My daughter is hysterical. How old was she? She was young, still about 10, 10 years old. 10 years old. She was crying hysterically. I was dealing with this crisis and now I had to leave them all alone because I had to take her to the hospital with the doctor. And they rushed her into emergency surgery and uh, they told me that the probability was high that she was going to die. Now I was busy with a campaign at, the sta at this stage as well. And so I went to the hospital and I said to her, I'm, st I'm staying with you. I'm not going to do the campaign. I'm going to cancel it. I'm going to phone them and tell them there's a crisis. And what did you say? Well, I can't remember, but you told me that I'd said um, that you must go. I'll be fine. Just go. She whispered, go. And I said, no, I won't, I won't make it. You won't, what, if, what if something happens to you when I'm gone? I'm going to be here. She said, no, go. God's work is more important mm -hmm. than your feelings. And so I, was, I went. I, I can't remember it, whether it was that one or the next one. But I was ill, I was sick. And I did the campaign, it was in, in Cape Town, so it was about a 40 kilometer drive there in a suburb and I did the campaign and uh, 
quite a prominent evangelist came into the church as a consequence of those meetings. And I remember I was sick as a dog on that stage while I was lecturing. And I did the whole lecture, ran off the stage after the lecture and was terribly sick. Drove home, had to stop the vehicle every few kilometers, get out and I was lying next to the road, terribly sick. And then I get back into the car and drive home, not knowing, I'm stressing because is she going to be alive when I get home or not? And uh, Eventually, she, she slowly started recovering. But the, she was so weak that they said to her she had to lie in bed. Was it six weeks? It was about six weeks before I could actually get up and move. Yes. Yeah. So now she's at home. And in the day, I have to go to work. I'm at the university. In the evenings, I've got lectures, campaigns. So I take the kids to school. Early in the morning I come back and I have to help her to go to the bathroom because she can't go there by herself. She's lying in this bed. She's very weak. And uh, I have to make her some food. So I gave her some avocado and some fruit and some bread and things and put it next to her bed so that she could have something to eat for lunch and then I'd have to go to work and leave her alone. And there's no one to take care of her, there's nobody who helps, we didn't know the people so well, etc. And now you can tell the rest of the story. Well, I, I was feeling a little bit depressed, I think I was weak, I wasn't sure why why these things were happening, many things were going wrong with us at that stage. In fact, as I said before, since he started to research these uh, things and lecturing the total transformation kind of lectures... Total onslaught. I mean total onslaught, yes. Um, he, uh, everything started to get worse and worse and our family was under attack and I was lying there and just thinking, you know, have I lost contact with God? Is He still there? Is he, is he still speaking to me? Where is He? And I remember uh, we had a German Shepherd dog and a cat and we used to leave the do back door open for the dog to come in and go out. And the door was open and the dog was sleeping in the passage and the cat was sleeping somewhere in the lounge and normally um, you know, they wouldn't let any other animal come into the house. And I heard these little footsteps up the pass, coming up the passage towards the bedroom. And the next minute there was this little squirrel. It was, it, it jumped right up onto the bed. And I was still thinking, how on earth did it get past the dog and past the cat? Because they would just destroy the poor animal. And so it jumped up onto the bed and I was at that moment propped up trying to eat my lunch with the avocado and the bread and the fruit and it came right up to the plate and it started eating on that side of the plate the food so I gave him his half and I get, took mine and so we sat there eating until he was finished and then he jumped off and he went and lay on the couch there was a couch in the bedroom and he lay there in the sun and for maybe an hour and then it went out past the dog, past the cat, and out. And I thought, wow, that's very interesting. It's so tame. Why would a wild animal do that? Next day... But you must remember that you love animals. Yes. So this was I love animals. I've always loved any kind of animal. And the next day, lo and behold, lunchtime, here comes the little squirrel up on the bed, has its lunch with me, and this happened every single day for the time that I was still in the in bed. And once I was, it was almost six weeks. And almost, and, and at the end of that period, I was able to get up and I went outside and I was trying to see where the squirrel was. And it was up in a tree. And it saw me and it came running down the tree and it ran up my leg, onto my shoulder, down the side and up into the tree. And that was the last 
time I ever saw the squirrel never came back again. Almost like it was saying goodbye. Yeah. I've been there for you. And in that time I was so strengthened because God, um, I knew God could even send an animal to, yeah. to make you feel that he's close because mm -hmm. that's his creation. Mm -hmm. And I felt that he was close even through a little squirrel. Well, Walter and Sonica, I think after listening to your entire story, it is very clear that God has been with you, that he has led you in miraculous ways and has been leading you this whole time to bring, to, bring you to where you are. And um, I think it's an encouragement to everybody who's listened to it. And I hope that our viewers will be able to be strengthened as a result of this and that even though maybe such dramatic things don't happen to them, but that they can find encouragement in the little things that happen in their own lives and that they will stay faithful through their own trials as you have stayed faithful. And uh, thank you very much for joining us and telling us your very long and very exciting story. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for joining us as well.